All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, weekly marketing call, I guess, or the bi-weekly, as I see it. Uh, so this is, I think, my first time joining. Uh, so my name is Victor. I'm a product manager here at GitLab. Erica has uh, kindly asked me to chat a little bit about portfolio management features um, and, and just have a general discussion here. Uh, I think she called it a, a training. I, I'd like to think of it more as a demo in a, in a two-way conversation. So what I'm going to do is just uh, quickly uh, screen share some, some ideas, some exi existing features, some things that we're doing in the future. Um, but please, please just interrupt me. Um, just cut me off as it's somewhere in our handbook that we should do um, and ask questions or, or uh, you know, say, say something is not a good idea, things like that. And we, I'd rather we have a discussion because everybody can, can click on the links themselves offline that I've provided in the agenda. So. Uh, my name is Victor. I'm a product manager at GitLab. If you click on the first link there, uh, the products categories page, it has a good number of uh, information there. In particular, you can find different product areas uh, within GitLab, and you can see the associated product manager uh, who is responsible. So if you ever have a question about a feature, whether you're using the feature yourselves day to day, or uh, you want to know how to market a feature, you have an idea, you want to do a blog post on and so forth, that's a great place to to figure out who's responsible or what area um, as, as a first pass. And then the next thing you can do is go into Slack the product channel and, and add mention that particular product manager to get more information. Um, and then as, as we've been learning from, uh, from the team call, we should avoid DMs as much as possible. And one, one more point I wanted to add to that, the, the, you know, the whole DM is not helpful thing, is not only is it um, not transparent and uh, the, the key about everybody contrib can contribute is, is true and beneficial and strategic for GitLab, but it's actually very practical for a need that you have. So what I tell a lot of folks, if they do me, I say, I, it's not that I don't want to answer you, but if I'm not here, if I'm on vacation, or maybe you just want to answer right away and you know I'm sleeping, um, it's actually better to um, uh, at mention me in a particular public channel but chances are my boss, who's you know five hours ahead of me, can answer your question, or maybe another product manager who's, who's several hours of me ahead of me can answer as well. So it's just it's just faster and more uh, practical in that sense. Um, so again, it's nothing personal when I tell people to to not DM me. Um, so jumping to letter B uh, in the agenda: design philosophy, flexible to versus, versus narrow use cases. If you click on that link there, it's uh, some high level information of what GitLab's vision and mission is. And so why I think that's relevant for today is because we're creating all these awesome features uh, for project management, and it's going to be used by our customers. It's going to be used by ourselves in the uh, product teams, the design teams, and the engineering teams. But ultimately, our goal as GitLab is to have all digital con um, content read right. And so that means, can folks use GitLab outside of just that narrow confines of developing software? And so we do that when we do blog posts and we do uh, content marketing, when we, when we update our website, a lot of that is not what we call quote unquote uh, software engineering day to day, but there's a lot more digital content and, and processes and, and work that we do day to day. And so at GitLab, you know, our marketing teams do use this, our support teams, uh, many non-engineering product teams are using GitLab already, um, but, but that's not very <laughs> unlikely the case for our customers and we want our customers and to do that. Um, eventually and it's going to be really hard uh, to do that without you know folks without ourselves first adopting that so that's why um, when Erica said like okay oh, you do you know a little uh, a demo or a training here for the marketing folks I said yes please please because we need folks like yourselves giving us feedback and another thing I like to tell uh, a lot of our uh, folks GitLabers in particular when they request a feature I said yes please tell us the features you want because it's a low risk high reward uh, uh, um, thing if we make an issue, if we do a feature that we use ourselves, it's low risk because we're guaranteed somebody is going to use it, so it's bound to be a great idea. And it's high reward because somebody's benefiting us. Yes, it, maybe it's not going to bring in a new deal, but ultimately there's productivity gains within GitLab, and that is strategic for the organization. So I get the, the benefit, uh, the, the, the curse and benefit of working on pro project management features, a lot of features in GitLab because um, a lot of my product area is used by all GitLabers. Um, and so that's benefit because I get feedback right away. It's a curse because I, uh, a lot of people get angry at me. But, but please continue get ang getting angry at me that your favorite feature is not being worked on yet because we need that constant feedback. 
Um, so I, I wanted to talk really quickly about some existing up, upcoming features. Uh, the issue board is something that we're really um, doing a lot of great innovation on, in my opinion, um, because we're leveraging the board to do so many things. And so that comes back to letter B, flexible tool versus narrow use cases. So some of the, the use cases that I'm going to go through really quickly now, um, if you look at different tools, they have very specific uh, features or UI to do those things. And, and how we innovate at GitLab is we provide a tool, a single application that can do many, many use cases. And this, so, so the strategy here is that we are um, creating less features, but that cover more use case and, and solve more solutions. Um, so, so that's the strategy. So uh, for example, a workflow tracking, uh, uh, DI workflow tracking, that's your typical agile board use case, your, your, your issues going from in development, development, in UAT and QA and so forth. Uh, letter uh, double I planning with different categories, that's just a byproduct of how we um, created issue boards for workflow tracking, not because we use labels for workflow stages. Now you can have just regular planning. So if you have lists with different types of labels, you can do that. So that's a great thing. And for, um, so I'm gonna share my screen really quickly here. For, because um, I'm going to start showing you some awesome things. For uh, team visibility, that's uh, something that we just shipped. So let me start closing these windows here, or tabs. Um, so this is an example of, oops, uh, a team board. And so uh, we actually don't have a team board. And so we say, oh, should we create the concept of a team board? No, that, that's, again, too, too narrow of a use case. So we'll just create a signy list. And so people can create a team board if they want. I, I've seen, I think, in the marketing, I think one of your boards have both assigning list and label list, and, and that's great. You use it the way that you need to use it. And so for this example here, the black platform backend team, um, the team, the engineering manager, individual contributors, they can quickly see um, what they're, if I'm James, I, I know what I'm responsible for, or you know, if I'm James L, I know what James E is look, responsible for, but if I'm James E, I can also see what James L is responsible for, and also Francisco. And so w right away, we've invented um, team management just by adding one list. And so I'm really excited that, um, again, we're using a board yet in a different way. Uh, what we're working on right now in 11.2 is yet another type of list, a milestone list. So, so you have 11.0 as a list, 11.1, 11.2. And so then as you're doing milestone planning, you can drag issues across milestones right away. And you can see how many issues, how much weight belongs to to a single milestone and you can drag them over one by one. If uh, a work uh, did not get completed in a previous milestone, you can drag it over. So so example in Jira, they have a dedicated view, a, a vertical view where you drag issues down instead of horizontally. That's a great UI. It's something that we might do in the future. I'm not saying that's not a poor feature. But with GitLab, instead of you know spending three months just to present something new and introduce new complexity, what we did is we just took something existing and then we made it more powerful. Um, so that's that's issue board assigning lists. And uh, I think that's what I'm calling the uh, fourth way of, uh, oh, sorry, a milestone list. And that's the fourth way we're using boards. Um, so to me, that's, that's very exciting. Um, burn downs and analytics. So burn down charts are something that we've had in GitLab for a while. And so this is something, again, that you know software teams uh, traditionally use um, again, as I said earlier, um, we, we want to take these lessons and these processes and, and, and see how the other industries or, or, or departments can use them. And let's not even say industries, just the other departments and how we want to track work, quote unquote, burning down. And so this has been great. It's, a lot of our customers have been using it. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't been using this view a lot. And, and so that's a problem. And so um, we're working really hard to make this usable for ourselves. And so that... Um, the, the idea here is that the reason we're not using it, or in particular, the, the product teams and engineering teams are not using it, is because our teams are not scoped to one milestone. Yes, we, we standardize on one milestone, 11.2, but the discussion team, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, the platform team, they all share this milestone. And so it's, it doesn't make sense that they're, that they're all looking at this burn down chart. And so one thing that we've thought about in the past, oh, can we just filter this burn down chart by label? And then the answer is yes. And so initially we thought, Let, let's do that. Let's build this in here. So, so that was a consideration. But then we, we, we thought, well, what's a better way to do that? What's a better way to do um, uh, project management in the context of teams? And so 
again, we went back to the board because that's, that has emerged as an innovation space for, for team workflows and team use cases inside GitLab. And so the next um, feature that we're going to be working on, which I'm really, really excited about, is having the burn down chart inside the board itself. So if you look at this uh, mock-up, it doesn't look really spectacular. Um, you know, it's just a regular burn down chart. But what you'll notice in the Chrome, at least, is that it's actually inside the board here. So the idea is that you're already using a board as a team. So whether you're a, a, a backend team at GitLab, whether you're a marketing team um, and that's responsible, or you're a crew, like within the marketing department at GitLab, maybe you're responsible for that particular area and there's a, a three-person team doing a spe specific task. And then you have a board just for yourself. And you want to see those issues burning down. So you've already created a board. You have, maybe you have a workflow, maybe it's planning, but you've already clicked the edit button and scope down your particular milestone, issue labels, and so on and so forth. So we've applied, or, or the design is that we're taking that scope, and let's just apply it automatically to the burndown chart. So you click on the burndown chart here, and then you see the burndown, and the scope is automatically applied. So you don't need to go to a different UI to look at the burndown chart. So, so that's something that I'm really excited about that, that, uh, that, that, we're, that we're hoping to ship um, probably in the next couple of months. Um, so that's burn down charts and boards. Analytics is an area at, inside GitLab that we've been working very hard uh, over the years, I would say, at GitLab. So we have things like second analytics, contribution analytics, uh, DevOps score, as we're calling it now, before it was ComDev index. Um, but we're, we're embarking on a new area called Valley Stream uh, analytics, or, or at least that's what the, the industry is calling it, what, what folks like Forrester have been telling us, uh, that it's a, it's a mature market and we need to get into. Um, so the idea here with value stream analytics is uh, something that we've known at GitLab and we've innovated on already for a long time, namely um, from idea to production or complete DevOps lifecycle as your idea is early on in the ideation stage, it, along the way it becomes requirements, or, you know, mock-ups, uh, uh, specifications, and it turns into code, and then the code is reviewed, and then it, it's QA'd, and then it's reviewed by, by product teams. Uh, other stakeholders, and then it's the shift to uh, maybe staging and production and so on and so forth. So the complete DevOps life cycle. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the idea here, <coughs> so I think we have a question, so please just interrupt. Uh, yeah, thank you, Elsie. And you can, you can just say you love this and interrupt me. Oh, no I'll problem. speak next time. <laughs> um, save, save, save me a click, Elsie. Um, so the idea here with uh, the life cycle is we want to know the time. So, so we've been innovating a lot. And if you look at psychoanalytics, some of our features, we, we've been saying, let's, let's figure out the time it gets, from, get, gets you from idea to production. And so the, the idea with some of the value stream analytics is can we get more insight? Can we know the, the, the time from idea to production but can we also know the time it takes you from to, to, uh, for, for a QA team to finish this issue? Can let us know the, the idea, uh, the, the, the stage of development or specifications, or maybe in some of these organizations, you need to spend like three months doing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, auditing or, or of the specs. Uh, uh, the technical um, architecture needs to be reviewed by the enterprise architect for a ver variety of reasons. And you want to quantify all that in terms of uh, time, uh, at least, and then if, is there overlap? Uh, can we speed things up? What is the blockers? Um, you've done things, you know, for the past 10 months. Uh, what, are, what is the low-hanging fruit of, of things that we can improve? Uh, what are some of the things that the legal team is saying we have to spend this time anyways, so we, we can't, um, can't short-circuit that time? So what are, what are some of the things that GitLab can, can equip our customers to help with this? And so, and, and so um, in talking with some of our prior marketing folks, uh, some of you folks on the call, um, some Forrester, some of our customers, we've come up with some initial design concepts and, and we're working really hard actually in this iteration to lay some of the technical groundwork and we hope to actually ship something in 11.3, a first iteration of this. So I'm really excited. So I'll show you some, some initial ideas here. So the idea, for example, in this particular mock-up, it says that uh, for a very simple, uh, you know, four-stage, uh, you know, uh, DevOps life cycle, as, as, you, as we might call it. A customer might have these four stages, and within the month of February, uh, on the average, this, you know, took, this stage took five days, this stage took six days, and in total, you know, you took 33 days. 
Um, over time, you've, you're, you can see that you know, uh, in this past half year, um, you've improved significantly. You can, see all the, you can even see the relative proportions where you've improved. So right away, this is a very valuable view of where, what time is taking. And what's interesting with this as well, and something that is new to GitLab, say compared to psychoanalytics and some of the, the previous work we've done, is that this is totally customizable. The idea here, the innovation here, is that we've taken our workflow issue board and you've already determined what stages you want, and you click a button and you get a UI similar to this, and it tells you what uh, the stages you already care about, um, uh, the, the relative times and ratios and how you can, you can do more. So just with this concept and just with these basic building blocks, you can, you can dig deeper. So let me finish up with this issue, and then I'll, I'll, I'll look at the, the chat again. Um, and so this is another similar view. And so you can see here, I've just, you know, grafted a, a sort of a different way, you know, flipped those X and Y axes. And I've also segregated or separated um, two sets of labels. So from here, you can see this top line is the useful work. And this is the, the bottom line is the, the wasteful work. So say your, your QA team went off to a uh, offsite summit for, you know, two weeks and they totally didn't you know, sync up with the rest of the organization, so, so that's not a good thing, and there was, there was poor planning. And then so you know, the engineering manager, the director can, can look at this after the fact and say, oh, why, why, why do we have this anomaly, and, and go back and, and address that after the fact. So, so that's a great thing. So again, this is something that Forrester have told us that the industry is looking forward to and something that we've verified when we talk to, to our customers that they're interested in. Just seeing that separation of useful work versus what they're calling waste. And so uh, something that we can do um, with, with GitLab. And uh, this is just the, the same thing, but stacked together. And so you can see the relative ratios. And then this is probably my favorite one here, which is allows you to drill down. And so the previous screen showed you the relative proportions. And so this will show you, say now that you're, you've identified QA is a problem. So let's drill down just to the QA stage. So this view is just gonna show me the QA times. And instead of showing just the average, which is this purple uh, uh, line chart within these you know, months, let's actually graph all the issues uh, that, that occurred in the month of January, February, and March. And let's look at their actual times uh, on this y-axis. So this one actually be, average time will be the purple, but these are the actual times. So now you can see the average. At a glance, you can see visually the distribution. And so you can see, you know, in the month of February, everything is concentrated around the average. That's good, you know, low uncertainty. In March, you can see, wow, there's three outliers. What happened here? And so if you're concerned about this as an engineering manager, or maybe you're a director, and you're, you're, you're in charge of three teams. And so any of these can be scoped to any, you know, granularity teams, number of issues, and so forth. Let's say you're the, uh, you're the engineering manager, and you want to really know what happened with these three issues. Why are there three outliers? You take your mouse. You just click on that button or you mouse over it and you see the issue, you click on it and you go to the issue itself and you can see through the comments, you click on the merge request, you can see what went wrong. So this is, you know, back to the power. So I'm, you know, it sounds like I'm selling GitLab to GitLabers, but GitLab is the single application. We have the entire stack. We have the entire application. Everything is integrated. So as we build analytics, we have, we're, we're cheating. We have everything. We have all the information. So I can mouse over the, the, the issue and I can go directly and find out what, what's wrong. And Victor, I just have to say, I love this. I am jealous of Cindy, who is doing the 11.3 release post. Okay. <laughs> we'll, get to, we'll get to write about this, because this is just really cool. Right, right, right. Def definitely, William. Um, so yeah, no, that, that's precisely right. So 11.3, I don't think we can get this entire screen. But I at least want to get the black dots. It may be the purple line. Getting this might be a little bit hard, but uh, I, I, at GitLab, we, we move really, really quickly. And I, so I really want to get something on the screen uh, into GitLab. So, so that, that's exciting. Um, so uh, the rest, I don't want to take too much time. I already took 20 minutes. Um, so subgroups, list milestones, and labels, this is, these are the bread and butter, the, the, the basic concepts of GitLab. And we continue to use them. And so subgroups is something that customers have been asking for. And in terms of project management, just that additional structure is super important. So, so do read up on the docs and look at relevant issues, but I don't want to spend too much time there. Multiple milestones per issue, again, that's something that customers have been asking for. And it's basically a blind spot for GitLab because our milestones and our releases, they're the same thing. 11.2 is an iteration that we work on GitLab for the month, but it's also the release. And so for some customers, they might work on five releases 
four, five iterations worth of work and then release it all at once. So they want a separate field to do that. And, and so from a project management perspective, that makes a lot of sense. It's very critical, something that we want. Portfolio management is a brand new area that we worked on pretty much uh, more than half a year now. We, we, we launched our, our first iteration of epics and, and roadmaps or I think just epics back, I think in November or October of last year. And so we've been moving really, really quickly and I'm really excited because things have just gelled together and, and really um, as we've developed it, as we've been using the features inside the product teams and the engineering teams, we see how these things come together and our customers are trying, are, are, are saying, oh, this is pretty awesome, I want this. And with the, the, other, the other ultimate and gold offerings, um, they're starting to pick up this work. So it's, again, it's really strategic for us to use it. And then once we have that level of feature and functionality, our, our customers are using it. And so the idea here is that we started first when we developed this feature, top-down planning and tracking and creating epics and roadmaps. And it wasn't the best of idea because we weren't really focused on our own use cases, but that's a, a different story I don't have time to get into. But the idea with epics and roadmaps or epics in general, epics are for if you look at epics right now, you can assign a start date and an end date and assign issues to the epic. Issues and milestones are separate, and then you know there's a connection that I just mentioned. But if you look at epics, there, there's no milestone assigned to an epic, and you might think that's that's weird. And so there's a little bit there's there's purpose to that. So if you look at this screen here, you can see that um, I, as, as a product manager, these are the epics I'm responsible for. But a lot of these far off epics in the future, I don't actually know what issues are gonna be part of them. I know just a general idea and I know um, I wanna start working on them in, in 2019 Q3, really far away. And I don't know if customers care about them. I don't know if they're, they're good ideas, but they're strategic. You know, I've talked to analysts, I've talked to customers that they want this general concept. So this is top down planning. These big ideas far into the future, I care about. And so at GitLab, we're, we don't have the tools and we don't actually do that very well just yet. And, but uh, epics and roadmaps right now can actually support that use case fairly well. You have an object called an epic, you have a start date and end date, and you just plop it on and away you go. What we can't do right now and what, what I'm anxious to be able to ship in 11.2 is bottoms up planning. So bottoms up planning here, what that means is that, again, with this view, with the, exactly the same view, I'm um, sorry, I'm jumping around, but now it's not far off in the future, but it's say this epic that we're working on right now and we're actually gonna be done. And so with this epic, there's probably 10 issues assigned to this epic. Um, there's probably five, I think. Um, and the issues have milestones associated with them already. So I actually don't want to set a start date and end date, or actually I want to replace the originally start date and end date that I set you know, half a year ago with the ones that are automatically inherited by the issue milestones themselves. And so that's exactly what we're building in 11.2. And that's exactly what product, our product folks have been asking for because we do a lot more bottoms up planning at GitLab versus top down planning. And so I'm really excited because I'm pretty confident that we'll be using a lot more epics and roadmaps once this feature ships. And namely, once you, you see this roadmap, you will be able to say for a given epic, I wanna use the, the automatic inherit milestone start and end date mode versus the far off into the future um, uh, top down, I don't know what issue, but I know the approximate start date and date of that epic mode. And so these are two separate modes that will be independently uh, set per epic. Um, so so that, that's what I want to differentiate between top down and bottoms up. And finally, this is really far off into the future, but something I'm uber, uber excited about. Uh, board list capacity, capacity planning, and roadmap. Something we don't do at GitLab, even on the product teams, um, but something that we're ramping up with, you know, engineering, uh, management becoming a thing with, with you know, uh, director level and just, just more and more engineering, uh, at being a more of a discipline at GitLab. And so the idea with, with board list capacity here is that now you can set actually a capacity per list. Um, so what I showed you earlier with the mouse on list, you can actually set a capacity per list. And so engineer managers can go there and set a, set a number. And so, this might seem like pretty trivial. Okay, you just add a number, that's not much. But it turns out this, if you think about it long enough, and, and I don't wanna take more time, but this will, and you know, I've, I've talked to some engineer managers and they would find this useful. And at a glance, you would be able to see, okay, you know, uh, in, in the 11.3 milestone, I have, you know, space for 50 weight, 
um, but I've assigned 120 weight. That's too much. What can we do? And you know, everybody has visibility to that. Taking the same exact concept, applying it to the roadmap. I think I, I really love this idea. I show this to a couple of folks who are excited about this. Can we do the same thing with capacity on the roadmap view? Probably. I don't know how that would look. That would be really confusing. The first uh, innovation here is that we're just going to sum up the weights of the capacity. Uh, or, or, sorry, of the, of the issues. So take a given epic here from July to December. Divide it uniformly. Say that there's 10 issues. The, the sum of the weights is you know, 100 divided by five uh, months. It's going to be 20 each. And so it's going to be 20 here, 20 here, 20 here, 20 here, and then add up all the ones vertically and you get a graph and you get a number here. So boom, right away, you're looking at the roadmap view and you can, a uh, product manager like me is uber ambitious and say, I want everything to be done in quarter three of 2018. And then, you know, Sean, my, my counterpart on the back end engineering side says, no, 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 Victor, you're crazy because uh, I've already estimated all these issues and weights and this is like 300 and we only ship like, 50 per month. And so this would be super useful for him, super useful for me, super useful for his, his manager, for Sid, for, for Eric, for, for Yo, for Mark and, you know, designer executive team, because they can see really far into the future. They can see a graph like this and they can see, oh, this is really, really important. I want this. I can't get it. Let's hire more people. So those conversations, I'm really excited that we, we can start having um, with a view like this. So thank you for entertaining me for 26 minutes. Uh, that's awesome. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, um, I, sorry, Eric, I didn't know how much time I, I was allotted. I, I, I wanted to finish like in 15 minutes, but I went way over. Um, but so I'll take questions or somebody can cut me off and tell me to, to run away so you can talk about other topics, but, uh, please shoot questions. Question, uh, Victor. So it seems like the yes. epic because right now I'm using, um, like, I think the marketing team is using issues, like we have meta issues to kind of do an overview of the rest of the smaller issues, uh, kind of like subtasks. So would that epic be kind of a replacement of that, like, meta issue? So it's easy to look at the hierarchy of, um, of the issues. Yes, Agnes, that, that's one of the uses we wanted to do with epics and... Uh, and so there's the answer is yes and no. So from a design perspective, that's where we're heading toward where an epic is a collection of issues that are related in feature and content, but not necessarily worked on like, you know, in the next five milestones together in succession. So they're related together in, in, in feature. So, so notice we haven't associated a milestone or even a group of milestones per epic. We might do it in the future, but it's not something we're doing right now. So yes, that's the intention. And um, from a use case perspective, it's just a nice placeholder. It's something that wraps on top. But from a use case perspective, as you're using it now, what I would recommend is look at what you need and say, look, oh, Epix doesn't support that yet, and I can't use it. And then, or, or um, what I, I would love you for folks to do is to take the jump and, and start using Epix and then start creating issues and features and saying, I really need this feature, Victor. Can you please, please, please create it? Um, so that's what we want to do. So usually when people ask me, should I use, you know, Epic for this? I say, yes, please, but I don't want to make your life terrible at the same time. So, so the idea is yes, you should, but realistically, uh, it's the same reason when people say like, I'm still using Google sheets to do planning. Um, I'm never going to yell at somebody to that, that they're doing that. I, I just sulk in a corner when somebody's using Google sheets to do planning because I haven't solved their use cases yet. So what, when that happens, I say, please share that Google sheet with me and we'll create the features to, to, to make sure you can move off of Google Sheets. And so we'll create the features so that you can move off of meta issues because you know, that, that's, not, that's not what we want to do. Uh, Joyce, you said, how do you switch from Epic to top and bottoms up? And so the idea here is that we'll just have a toggle or, or we're creating it right now. Um, and so that's exactly here. So I'll just show it here. So you get to choose the, the start date, whether you want to use the fixed version or the uh, or the, the inherited version as we're, we're calling it. And then by default, it will be the inherited version, which makes sense because when you create an epic, uh, there's no date set. So say you create an epic and start assigning issues on it, so it'll automatically inherit. And then, but if you did want to set a manual date, you would do so and then you would click and but by that time you can over, quote, quote, override it. Um, so that's how you would 
switch, quote unquote, switch the modes. Um, and so it's actually more granular per epic, it's actually per date per epic. Hmm. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, any other questions, comments by or... Hey, Victor. Um, yes. So, it, you know, it seems to me that like the, the most benefit, you know, teams would see or teams of teams would see is, uh, is really just going to be unlocked when um, kind of across the teams people are using um, issues uh, and epics uh, and related features consistently. I was wondering if you could share anything from product or engineering in terms of what has worked well to kind of establish the, you know, consistent usage across the teams. So, so you're asking like how, how ourselves, our, our process is um, using these features? Is, is that, is that? Or, or maybe like um, uh, and anything that has been useful in driving consistent usage across you know, okay. many people across many teams. Yeah, yeah, and I can probably guess why you're asking that as a, as a scaling organization uh, at GitLab and we're growing. Um, so uh, I'm missing a product team call right now and they're probably arguing about some new process or change or something that they want to make things better. Um, and so, yes, we, we, we have struggles and, and stuff like that um, with getting things consistent. So, so I can share some things with you, for example, uh, label usage is something that, that we, we we use a lot with. And the reason we use labels is we can always use, because labels are so versatile and so useful, it's always the first thing we go to because we haven't created a new native feature to support that particular process yet. And so, for example, um, we want to track missed deliverables uh, within our organization as an OKR for the engineering team. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to have a bot um, that's going to crawl all the issues and then look at after the code freeze, if you missed the deliverable, put a label on it and then maybe put two or three labels on it. And so we can track those labels over time and we can say in 11.3, you know, X percent was missed and stuff like that. So that's an example where um, we need a consistent process and, and we're trying to use automation to make it easier uh, as, as well as consistent because, you know, bots don't make mistakes in terms of consistency. And because the feature that we're building will take, you know, maybe three more, four more months. And so the feature we're going to build is similar to what I showed earlier with the analytics. We would actually, the, the latest idea I have is that we're actually going to use the burndown chart and you're going to filter the burndown chart on, on missed deliverables. The burndown chart is going to be historically accurate. And so you can look at the burndown chart and see how many things were, 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 were planned at the beginning and how many things were shipped at the end and you get a number. So, that's the feature that's going to solve that problem for GitLab, but that's the feature that is not, is not going to be shipped for like at least maybe three, four months. Um, so how do we solve that in the interim? We, we do quote unquote hacks around the, the thing like that. And another example is, is like using, just using epics and issues ourselves. And then the example um, Agnes had, or the question Agnes had with should epics replace meta issues? And um, maybe we're doing that. I would say 80% of the time folks are not using meta issues anymore and using epics but still that's not always 100% of the case. So, so we are having some, and so, so how we quote unquote solve the consistency issue is that, you know, we standardize, we have a meeting, you know, we have a handbook, update, probably same as the marketing team, I would imagine. Makes sense. Thanks, Victor. Definitely. So yeah, so again, I create, uh, encourage everybody to just ping the product channel, even better ping myself in an issue. Um, at mention me in an issue, at mention me in a product channel if you have any ideas. Um, and, and we'll go from there. And uh, I'll stop and share my screen and give the mic to somebody else. And I'll, I will see everybody Thanks. next time. Thanks, Victor, for presenting. Definitely. Thanks, Um